Lasers coming in from every angle. Arnold does like a backflip whilst he's got two Uzis and he's firing through the air. And Harrigan, like, he throws Harrigan like a missile. Harrigan's like, wah! Like, he like takes the predator, takes predator's head clean off. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone are two of the greatest action stars on the planet, and they've both created a sizable catalogue of franchise characters, including the Terminator, Rambo, Rocky, Conan the Barbarian. As they've both gone older, I think their careers went from being very similar to quite different because of one key factor. And Creed 2 is essentially Rocky 8. I know there's a lot more to it than that, and Michael B. Jordan's Creed is the lead, but it still managed to keep Rocky on our screens in a way that makes sense, in a way that we care about. So why has Arnold never been able to do this? Sylvester Stallone has managed to continue his greatest franchise character, whereas if we look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator is probably his closest equivalent, and with Terminator Genesis and the untitled Terminator reboot coming out next year, we still don't really know if he's ever going to be able to pull that off and bring back that character in a meaningful way. The key difference as to why I think Stallone has managed to see success with Rocky, where Arnold has not with the Terminator or any of his other franchise characters, is because Stallone makes a virtue of his age. You look at something like Creed and Creed 2, but even as far back as Rocky Balboa, which is essentially Rocky 6, every single one of those stories revolves around the fact that Rocky is a character that's too old to get into the ring, either as a mentor figure or as someone that has agreed to take a fight when he knows he really shouldn't, because he's not the powerhouse that he used to be. That's what's interesting about taking a character like Rocky, who we know as being this strong man, and then seeing him get older. You look at something like Arnold's T-800 on the other hand, and they've never done that. We see him get older, but it's always for like a plot reason rather than a strong character motive. Terminator Genesis, for example, they get around the fact that he's a bit older by saying that he's been looking after Sarah Connor for years and years and years and that his skin has aged, which is fine. I think that's actually quite an interesting idea, but their dynamic isn't really that different to the dynamic between John Connor and the T-800 in Terminator 2. And they've known each other for a few days, whereas the Terminator Genesis relationship is years. So why are we not seeing a palpable difference? If he's a learning machine, then what has happened in those years to truly shape him and make him feel unique and new and fresh? Um, if they did something like that and they made a virtue of the fact that he is getting older, maybe he's getting a bit rusty, literally, um, then that could be something that would make that character successful again, but they haven't done it. And of course Miller and James Cameron working on the Terminator reboot, which is going to come out next year, which we know will have Linda Hamilton back and Arnold back. I think it's best to, you know, um, give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that they can do something really fresh and exciting. So I don't want to, you know, pitch anything or get into that too much. What I want to do is look at how Arnold could do what Stallone did for Rocky with another big franchise that he was a part of, namely the Predator franchise, something which I think is in dire straits after this year with the release of Shane Black's The Predator, which could be one of the worst films I saw this year. Now, no disrespect to Shane Black, I like a lot of the stuff he's done in the past and I'm sure him and the team all tried really hard on it, but I think it just kind of misses the mark as to what a Predator movie should be. And it's got these kind of like weird deviations from the canon, which, you know, I always can appreciate new ideas, but I think this flies so far in the face of what the first movie is. You've got human characters running around with Predator guns, you've got this giant predator as the main threat like that to me flies in the face of the subterfuge and you know that the tension from the first two movies of having this invisible hunter stalking its prey um, and then you have a predator iron man suit at the end which it's implied boyd holbrook's main character is going to be using that to fight more predators in a sequel that's never going to happen i mean do you really want to see that do you really want to see an Iron Man suit fighting Predators. I mean, yeah, I do want to see that, but like, you know, in my head, not in the Predator franchise, it's not right. And then, you know, stuff like Predators, which came out in 2010, it's cool ideas, but it just didn't quite do what it, it wanted to do. And, and I feel like if we're gonna bring back Dutch, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Dutch, then let's, let's go all out. Let's actually make him an integral part of the movie. So if I was gonna make the next Predator movie, there's two things that I would do. I would want to bring back Arnold Schwarzenegger in a key role, and also want to take a leaf out of the Rocky book 
and make it a boxing movie. And I don't mean make it a literal boxing movie, obviously. I don't want to see Dutch take up the gloves and fight a predator in the ring, although that sounds like a great robot chicken sketch. Uh, I just mean a boxing movie in the sense of the way The Dark Knight Rises is a boxing movie. You take two characters, they agree to fight, they know it's coming, it's inevitable, and they both train or prepare in their own different ways, and we're presented with questions about their wants and their needs and whether or not they should go through with that fight, whether or not they're gonna seriously injure themselves or die, and all the great tension that comes out of that. And hey, maybe this pitch will be even worse than The Predator and Predators, but it's just a bit of fun and I thought I'd give it a go, so let me know in the comments below what you think of it, I'd love to know. Full disclaimer, I've seen Predator 1 and 2 a lot, and I really, really like those movies. Um, but I'm not too tooled up on the larger Predator lore, so if I say something that retcons a 90s Predator comic that I've never read, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm obviously always going to try to fit within established canon and established rules as much as possible, but I also kind of want to tell the best story possible. Um, but I'm going to try to not contradict anything if I can help it. I mean, by comparison, I know my Star Wars lore way better than I know my Predator lore, and with my Obi-Wan Kenobi pitch, which, to be fair, was a lot more fleshed out than this one, um, there was still one or two little continuity errors with some comics and some, some other pieces of media. I think that's always going to happen when you do these sort of pitches. Um, but as I say, I'll try my best. Cool, so I think that's everything covered. I think the only thing left to do is give us some dramatic lighting. So. Predator 3. We're not going to call it Predator subtitle or The Predator, Predators. We're going to call it Predator 3 to signal that it is a direct sequel to Predator and Predator 2. We start Predator 3 with Dutch, the lead from the first movie played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's living by himself in the Canadian mountains. It's winter time, it's snowy everywhere. Um, he's living off the fat of the land essentially, he's hunting for food, he's making firewood, He's doing it all himself, he's living in complete solitary. Why is this? So the Dutch that we meet at the start of this movie is not the same Dutch that we left in Predator 1. He's had a bit of an existential crisis about the events of that movie and he's chosen to live a life by himself. And the reason for that is because he saw all of his friends die, he went through a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, fighting a hostile alien force which was far superior to not only him but his species. And even though he did win, what did he really gain from it? He would not be able to have the same conversations with the people that were back home because they've not had that same experience. He's got no one to talk to who would take him seriously. They just want to exploit him for information, essentially, like with Gary Busey's character, Peter Keyes, in Predator 2. We know that he spoke to him whilst he was hospitalised after the events of the first movie. And then he disappeared. So now we know that that loops back around to this. He chose to leave, chose to say no to all of that. I do not want to see these creatures ever again, but I know that I can't return to the world that I once lived in. Fighting an alien and learning that there's other worlds out there has made him essentially feel really small. It's made all of the things that were in his life feel really pointless. And I think the only response he has for that is to, is to run away. A new predator lands on Earth and makes a direct beeline for these Canadian mountains so we know that this predator is coming for Dutch. Dutch hears the predator coming. It's not, it's not stealthy, by the way. There's no, there's no, there's no espionage. Um, I know it's es es espionage. Please don't, don't comment. The predator approaches his lodge where he's living, and Arnold looks around because he can hear something, you know, scuttling through the trees, and he hears that distinctive predator cackle coming up from above him in the rafters, and the predator is obviously expertly found its way into his home. Rather than trying to defend himself or trying to find some way to attack the predator, he kind of just stands there and looks at it and the predator looks at him back and they, they kind of you know, share this moment. And you kind of get the feeling that he's happy that there's a predator here because it means that he can finally kind of die. He's lived alone for so long, thinking about that event. 
wondering if he would ever come face to face with another one of these creatures. And now that he finally has, he's ready and expecting to die. And this will be that final release, which he's been craving. So he waits there and he's looking at this predator, almost egging him on to do it in a way. But the predator doesn't do that. It stares back at him, baits him a bit, and then it starts playing this recording out of its device, which we recognise and Dutch recognises as the what would be the POV of the predator from the first movie stalking him and his team. And we see like you know just snippets of that first movie right up until he takes his mask off and leaves it on the ground. So basically that predator is communicating to Dutch that he is tied to that predator in some way. Maybe it's a descendant from that bloodline. Maybe, you know, they knew each other, maybe they hunted together, but he's back here for that reason and he knows who Dutch is. So he shows him that and then he drops a, like a predator flare onto the floor, which illuminates it. Dutch looks down and what we see carved out on the floor are coordinates and a date, which is in about Three months time as he looks back up the predator has just vanished just batmaned out of there so this is the boxing movie setup that we have for the movie dutch has been challenged by this predator so it might initially seem strange that the predator has come into contact with dutch and not immediately tried to slice his head off but i think it's because he's an old man he clearly hasn't picked up a gun in a very long time and i think this predator wants a proper challenge, it wants an honourable fight, a battle to the death. And by giving him coordinates and a date, it allows Dutch the opportunity to do what they do in all the best Rocky movies, and that's him making the decision, yes, I'm gonna take the fight, I'm gonna train, I'm gonna get as strong as I possibly can be, and then I'm gonna take on, you know, this Goliath. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, that's the structure of the movie, it's like Rocky. This predator has come all the way across the galaxy specifically to fight Dutch, the deadliest man on the planet, the man that could take out a predator, and he is not going to pull any punches three months' time when they meet again, and it's going to be the rematch to end all rematches. And for Dutch, it's now given him a purpose which he has not had in a long time. It gives him the chance to, to get some closure on what happened. And even though we all know what a predator looks like in pop culture, I don't think the movie should treat it as such. We should be seeing the predator from shadows. We should be seeing little glimpses of his, of his hands and stuff. You know, it, it should bring back the mystique from that first movie. So as the inciting incident wraps up, uh, we are reintroduced to another returning character from the Predator series, and that is Danny Glover's Harrigan, who is also now an old man. And rather than going back to what his original life was as a detective at the end of the second movie, he's also a completely different man, but instead of going the solitary route, he's become a company man. The Otherworldly Life Forms Program, I think it is, in the second movie, is that right? It's got a really bad name. Yeah, Otherworldly Life Forms Program. A terrible name, but we're gonna stick to it. We're gonna go with it, we're gonna keep it. Um, we're just not gonna refer to it that much by name. <laughs> um, and he has devoted his entire life to studying these predators, to getting to know them every time one comes to Earth, which is getting more and more frequent. And he's been tracking predators, trying to learn as much about them as possible every time one comes to the planet to hunt. But of course, they're predators, so this organisation is not very good at it. They're about as competent as they were in the end of the second movie. Um, they're not going to be using predator guns like in The Predator, none of that stuff. Um, they, they, they've been trying to get as much intel as they can and they know a little bit, they know kind of that they're there to hunt, they know the sort of weaponry they use, kind of tactics and that sort of thing. Um, but it's still a far cry from being able to easily take out a predator, which I think Thor Harrigan has always been a bit unsatisfying. And because of that, of course, uh, Harrigan has been tracking heat signatures of predator ships when they enter the atmospheres that they know, so they can start you know, tracing. Um, any predator that's on a potential hunt. He sees that, well him and his team see that the predator has gone to the Canadian mountains and Harrigan gives this kind of look of, you know, like he knows why 
perhaps why that predator has gone that way and he says that he would like to be dropped off there by himself. So he goes there and uh, Dutch and Harrigan meet and he walks up to his doorstep and obviously Dutch is shocked that someone knows where he is, wants to know how. Harrigan sort of implies um, that he's known he's been there for a very long time and he has purposely let him be rather than, I've mentioned Gary Busey too many times. You can never have enough Gary Busey. But yeah, you know, they, they both recount war stories of dealings with predators, obviously. And Dutch talks about the events of the first movie. Harrigan talks about the events of the second. And he also mentions the antique pistol he was given at the end of that movie by the predators, which he now keeps on his mantelpiece and has never quite let go of. And then they loop back around to talking about why this predator is here and Harrigan also guesses that it's probably a descendant of that clan of Predator and that he's probably here for this, this big rematch. Assuming that Dutch will want help, that he'll want refuge, that he'll not want to fight. Uh, but of course Dutch says to him, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to train three months time. I'm going to take the fight. I'm going to, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win, um, which I don't think he really believes. Harrigan says to him, you know, you're crazy. Not only are predators stronger and faster, they're stronger and faster than Dutch when he was in his prime, when he was, you know, this Austrian powerhouse. Whereas now he's aging, his muscles aren't what they used to be, um, his mind's not what it used to be, quite frankly. He's going to lose this fight, there's almost no doubt. And Harrigan pleads with him not to be a complete idiot, not to take it, but he can see that Dutch needs it. I think this whole thing should feel a little bit like uh, where we meet the present day Rust Cole and Marty Hart in True Detective Season 1. Like, you know, these, these guys essentially ruined their lives because they were so obsessed with Predators. Never got married, never had any kids. Um, both quite lonely men and they can share this experience and it's quite nice that they get to talk and talk about how it felt to fight Predators. Um, but Harrigan still doesn't agree that he should take the fight. He's trying to plead with him as much as he can. And at the very least, he's like, can you give me the coordinates? Can you tell me when? And Dutch flat refuses. So he has nothing to go on. There's no way he can help him. But he resides to that fact and he wishes him good luck. So now we have all our thrust for the story. We've got our A plot where Arnold is going to prepare for this fight. And then we've got our B plot where Harrigan is trying to track down the Predator as he would as part of his job with his team and because this Predator is, is one, one of the best, one of the better Predators that he's ever come across, he knows he's being, he's being tracked, which is why we get to globetrot a little bit in the second act. We get to see this Predator go to the Middle East and we get a, a set piece there and all the time, all the while Harrigan's team are following him, they're getting picked off one by one. We get to know them just enough so that we, you know, we give a shit when they get torn to shreds. And um, meanwhile, the A plot is is full on Rocky, Rocky three, Rocky four. We've got Arnold lifting logs. He's, you know, he's pumping the iron. He's getting ready. This predator is going on what is described as a whistle stop tour of all of Earth's most hot, intense battlefield uh, locations, which we know predators love. Um, so you get to go to the Middle East and uh, we go to like another American city that's got a lot of gang violence which you know harkens back to the second movie and for Harrigan probably is bringing up unpleasant memories once again. His whole team are getting decimated as per usual, he's losing more men which, which it's implied he's done routinely across his entire career um, and he's outlived all of them and now he's this old man that has to sit in the chair whilst uh, everyone else is doing the nitty gritty, trying to trap one and kill one. Um, and I think across this second act, his his story gets more and more grim as he sees all these people getting killed and he comes to see just how ferocious and powerful this younger, hungrier predator is. Uh, to the point where we find him just sat realising and and saying to to one of his colleagues that, you know, this is utterly fruitless. I've been doing this for years and really it's utterly, and really it's, it's, it's pointless because no matter what they do, no matter even if they, even if they do kill this one, 
another one will just come come and land in a few years time and go on another hunt and he's never going to be able to save everyone he's never going to be able to stop them coming there's nothing they can do i think he perhaps thought he was the more hopeful of the two between him and dutch and when he met dutch at the start of the movie he thought oh you know at least i'm not that whereas by the time we get to the end of the second act he's become more that way and he's sat there realizing that this is all pointless he's going to keep sending men in um you know young people younger than himself to get torn apart um and i think he just feels guilty and fed up meanwhile dutch is barely hanging on to his old body you know we were saying earlier we want to make virtue of his age he's coughing up blood he's getting tired he's feeling the cold uh, weather in the canadian mountains he's he's not the same man he's not a powerhouse anymore he's still strong he's still a big guy but it's clear uh, no no amount of training is going to prepare him for this fight he is done but he keeps going anyway there's days to go at this point uh, before the fight and i think dutch kind of realizes maybe i wasted my entire life uh, thinking about that day rather than moving on and I think he breaks down a little bit and he gets a bit teary which is not something we've seen from Arnold much so I think that'd be really cool to see him do this and realizes that being that big action hero in that first movie didn't end up serving him all that well um, but it's too late for him now he's too old there's no point him trying to have another life um, it's this match or nothing and he's going to go ahead and do it anyway. We cut back to Harrigan, who, you know, they've, they've, they've moved around a bit around the globe now, and they see that they're tracking this heat signature of this predator, and it's gone to its next location. And Harrigan knows that location, he recognises it. We don't see it as an audience, but all he says to his colleague is that he wants to be on the next plane and to not tell anyone about the fact that we found the Predator for at least 72 hours. We cut back to Dutch and he's on a plane, he's touched down, he's, he's going to the location where he's going to have this fight and it is the exact same jungle from the end of the first movie. So we're back there, we're back exactly at the same spot. It's very nearly time. He sets as many traps as he can, um, he hides weapons in corners so that he knows he'll have backup plans. He's got backup plans on top of backup plans. Um, and he knows this area inside out because he's never forgotten about it. Um, meanwhile, the Predator is doing the same. So we're cutting back and forth seeing that happen. And then they meet and it is go time. And they're going to have the rematch to end all rematches. So it's, it's a bit of a riff on the first film, the finale. But it's also a bit different because this Predator hunts differently. Um, and Dutch can't do any of the things he did in the first movie. Um, he's struggling, but he's got experience on his side. He's tooled up. He's, he's come into this fight knowing it's going to happen. Um, but he still loses, of course, because that's what we've been setting up across the whole movie. Harrigan has entered the jungle during this fight. He's heard the sounds, the screams, and we know he's coming as an audience, but Dutch doesn't know he's coming, and it's kind of a question of, Will he get to them in time to save Dutch and get them out of there? He wounds him enough that he's lost his ability to go invisible. You know, he's limping a little bit, this predator. You know, he's, he's taken a dent out of this perfect hunting creature, which might be enough for him. But, you know, he, he doesn't seem happy. I don't know if he'll ever smile ever again at this point. Dutch is literally about to get kebabbed by the predator. Finally, Harrigan shows up. He's got his own weaponry. He blasts the Predator off the side of the waterfall and it buys them probably a good few minutes if the Predator isn't already dead, um, which of course it isn't. Um, so he picks Dutch up. He's like, I've saved you. He's come all this way alone. So no one's going to know about the fact he's still alive. Um, so he's, I don't think he's all safe. We're all, we're all fine and dandy. And instead Dutch is still like, no, I want to fight this Predator. Why are you here? I want to do this by myself. Like, like, basically, he's ruined his big death moment. Harrigan, after everything he's been through, just stops and he's like to him, listen, this is not an honourable fight. It's never been an honourable fight. These predators have always 
always vastly outmatched human beings. They've always had better weaponry, uh, you know, better tools. They, they've been stronger. And he, he says to him, you know, hunting for sport against prey that is unable to properly defend itself is never going to be honourable. Uh, he's basically saying the predators are bullshit and that their entire code is bullshit and he knows that now and he's spent all this time trying to fight them for that very reason and now it's time to turn the tables on them and they're going to fight dirty just as the predators fight dirty. They're not going to candy coat it, they're not going to say it's something that it's not. They're going to go back, finish the job and flank this predator. And then finally that's when Dutch is like, okay. Harrigan, someone he barely knows, has come all this way just to stop him from being killed. And for the first time in a very long time, his life feels like it is worth something and that someone cared about him enough to, to risk their own for him. And that's what gets him to pick himself back up off his feet. And Harrigan chucks him a, chucks him a shotty. And uh, they're like, let's, let's, let's get this predator. <laughs> um, it's two old boys versus one wounded predator, which makes for a bit more of a fair fight. And the fact that they are not fighting by this weird kind of code is what gives them the upper hand. They basically beat the predator in his own game and we get to the point where he's mortally wounded. So they, they end up standing over this predator, bleeding out. They've won. Harrigan pulls out his antique pistol and gives it back to the predators essentially by giving it to this predator, um, showing that he is done with it. He's got, he's got the closure he needs. And this whole thing kind of baffles the predator because these two men aren't giving him respect as a hunter. They're giving him respect as a being that is about to die um, by giving him that pistol. So rather than him doing the thing that all predators do in a really cowardly way and self-destruct uh, the area so that no one ever wins, um, he decides not to do it and he bleeds out. Dutch's suicide mission didn't end up being a suicide mission and I think he's been given a renewed sense of purpose and again parallels to Detective, they know they're never going to be able to get them all but they know they got their guy, they got the one that mattered and the rest of it is just noise, it's bigger than them, there's no point Trying to, to, trying to worry about that, they need to get on with their own lives. He now knows that it doesn't matter if he's old, still a chance for him to make something of his life, still a chance for him to do all these different kind of things. His identity is still secret because no one else came other than Harrigan, so Harrigan's given him that. And the two of them now, uh, with that closure on what happened to them in Predator 1 and Predator 2, can go off onto pastures new. And for the first time in the entire movie, we finally get to see Dutch smile, and that's how it ends. So that's Predator 3, it positions them both as the leads, ties up that story. If you want to push ahead of a Predator 4 in the same way that you go from Rocky Balboa to Creed, make uh, Dutch the Rocky character in Creed, make him a mentor figure, pull him completely out of the way of any conflict and bring in a new lead. And if you don't agree with me, um, I just want to say right now, that I firmly believe in everything I've just said, but I am also willing to sell out. So basically, Predator 4, Predator Island, ignore everything I just said, we bring Dutch back, we bring Harrigan back, they're in the whole movie, they're taking on the Predators on their home planet, Predator Island. We'll ignore all of the problems with their age and they'll just, they'll just have a rip in time and we can bring back the Iron Man mech suit. Lasers coming in from every angle. Arnold does like a backflip whilst he's got two Uzis and he's firing through the air and Harrigan like, he throws Harrigan like a missile. Harrigan's like, wah! Like he like takes the Predator, takes Predator's head clean off. Um, they fight the, not, not a giant predator from the predator, it's like an even bigger predator, it's like twice the size of that predator and they have a big battle with, uh, with that predator, there's a bit where Arnold's flying a spaceship, flying two spaceships at the same time actually, lightsabers, it's in 3D, um, what else happens to the predator? Adrian Brody pops up, of course they're tearing through them and at the end predator gets um, the, the predator's crown, Dutch is their new king and it's all in the same universe as Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> Full Fat Videos is going to strange new places.
Full Fat Videos just got upgraded, and along with that, we're upgrading our Patreon with new tiers and rewards just for you. We don't unfortunately monetize most of the videos on the channel because it has copyrighted content. So something like Patreon could really, really help us make Full Fat Videos self-sustaining, and it'll allow us to make better videos and better content for you. For just $1 a month, you'd be helping us out a great deal already, which is why we thank you at the end of every video. Not to mention you'd get exclusive access to Full Fat Milk Posting, a Facebook group where you can talk to us about movies, TV and games, as well as some memes. We like a bit of memes. For $3, you'll get access to everything from the previous tiers, but you'll also get the chance to watch our videos one day early, as well as get access to exclusive scripts and bloopers. For just $5 a month, you'll get access to everything from all the other tiers, as well as exclusive access to ask the questions for our monthly Q&As. And that's not all. For just $10, you'll get access to all of the above, as well as an exclusive commentary track picked by you. For $100, I mean, you'd, you'd be keeping the lights on, so we'd really appreciate it, and we'd probably thank you at the end of every video on, on camera. You'd be really helping us in any way, shape, or form if you could consider contributing to our Patreon. We love making this stuff for you guys, and we'd love to keep making more of it. So thank you, and thank you for watching. We're off to go make some more of that juicy content. We'll see you next time. Stay milky.